Well, good afternoon again, and welcome back to Bite-Sized Corrosion. As we mentioned yesterday, today we're going to start to unpack NACE SP502 on ECDA, and we'll be focusing on the first stage, which is called pre-assessment. Today, we're really delighted that we can welcome Frances Bradfield to share the mic with us. Frances is actually the current chair of the CO Core Working Group on Overline Surveys. So we've got a, an expert with us today. She's got such a passion for problem solving and really getting her hands dirty to ensure she gathers reliable data in the corrosion sector and also takes cognizance of assessing risk and providing guidance. So I think she's really well suited to this discussion on ECDA. And so warm welcome, Fran. Where are you based right now? Thanks, Vanessa. It's great to talk to you guys. I'm currently in Denmark, sitting in the middle of a tiny, tiny town on a pipeline project. So I've got dirty boots, but lucky you can't see them. As you may know, our first session yesterday in this winter 2022 series of Bite Size Corrosion we identified that ECDA is a really good process to be used in pipeline integrity management. And I think the NACE standard describes the process really well, but one can feel a little overwhelmed when we look at what is required. Now, the first stage they call pre-assessment, and I'm just going to share the flow sheet. We can chat through what this is all about. Fran, do you want to get us going on it? Yeah, so from Neil and Vanessa's session yesterday, we remember that the ECDA protocol is only for non-pickable pipelines. So this is a way that we can use all the knowledge that we've got to sort of make our risk-based assessment, which of course we'll go through within these next weeks. The pre-assessment phase I actually think is probably the most important phase of this ECDA. Mm -hmm. It's where you take all your information that you already have on the pipeline, and you use that to see what information you're missing and then further on into which locations you need to inspect visually. The main thing here is to look at the historical data. And one of those things in some cases is even where is the pipeline? We, <laughs> True story. We have too many as-built drawings. And I say it like this because somebody draws a line on a map. That does not necessarily mean we know exactly where that pipeline is. If we don't know where the pipeline is, we can't be 100% sure of the accuracy of the data that we get. So the data collection here in this initial thing is to take data from previous surveys and to really pry open the minds of the people who were there in the beginning of the pipeline. Usually ECDA is performed on older pipelines. Modern pipelines, we, we tend to make a little bit more allowances for, with the exception of water pipelines where we have valves that make it unpeggable. But we try to make our pipelines designed so that we can peg them. And the modern pipelines have got all sorts of nice GPS data, et cetera, which help us, for example, to know exactly where it is. And the record keeping is slightly better. So Fran, we'd, we'd set up something like this little spreadsheet here to figure out what we know about our pipeline. Exactly. So the first main thing is what information you really have. And usually, if you've got cathodic protection on your pipeline, which let's face it, we really hope you do, you will have at least some record of potential monitoring. So in a good case, you'll have at least one survey per year at every single test post along your pipeline. And you can use that to see where historically you have had low potentials, for example. And you can see here that that would come in to a little bit, maybe underneath streak current severity, for example, and you could use that as one of your factors. Your next factor would be environmental. So as you see here, Vanessa's got something that says stray current severity. If you're in the vicinity of like a high voltage train line or power line, for example, you have a higher propensity to corrosion in that area. So that's another thing. I think it's also important to remember that when we do this direct assessment, we're going to be doing excavations and those are super expensive. They mm. sometimes have to close down roads. We've got to get work permits from refineries or maybe even shut off water if it's a high pressure main, for example. So there's lots of stakeholders involved and it's a big, very expensive procedure. So we want to limit the number of excavations we do. And the way we do that is by taking all the data and highlighting the worst case places and which places we can say uh, like for like. For example, you have a place with 
good protection in dry sandy conditions and you have five of those places along your pipeline you only need to look at one of those you don't need to do five excavations so that's sort of calling i think they they term it zoning they do term it zoning yeah, yeah. and you can decide how to zone your pipeline up to you with budget and what information you have available you can decide on the most necessary zoning types that you want i think that's quite important that we realize that although the NACE standard helps us to figure out a decent process, it's not prescriptive. So it doesn't tell us you have to put A and B in the same category if they show this. In this. You are using your brain, as it were, and interpreting the information you have. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, again, we need to come back to this idea of risk-based inspection or risk management. And mm -hmm. Again, like I think you mentioned yesterday, Vanessa, or maybe it was Neil, if you have a pipeline going underneath a school, that would be a higher risk than one that's going underneath a field, for right. example. And that, again, even though you might still have two sandy areas, for example, the one under the school is definitely a different zone from the one that is a field, in my opinion. So I think it's important to understand that that looking at your pipeline, you're not only looking at the pipeline itself, but its entire environment and who the affected parties would be in a sense, particularly in a corrosion scenario. Precisely. And actually, Vanessa, this is a great example that you have up on the screen here. You can see one of the factors here that we're looking at is the pipe itself. I think this is a very old pipeline, probably from the 50s, something like that. Not 100% sure. But you can see here that each section of the pipe has got a specific history. There was a leak here, somebody hit it with a back actor here, somebody didn't coat this section properly, and now we have large scale coating detachments and all of the remedial works that have gone on in the, in the past really do impact what we are going to look at here. And so that's why I say picking the brains of the good old guy who's been chained to his desk for 80 years, before he goes on retirement is really where you need to go. If you have anything over maybe even 10 years old, the guys who have been hanging around in operations are your best friend. I think that's quite an interesting point, Fran. I think a lot of data today still rests in these old crumpled paper maps, uh, yeah. old alignment sheets, old drawings, and not everything is digitized. And there's also a challenge when, as you say, the old man who's about to retire, and, and I say old man because many of them are male. And the difficulty, of course, is also that someone heading into retirement, you can still spend some time with them. But if they've passed on, then that information is lost. So yeah. in a sense, asset owners don't realize the resources that are vested within their employees' memories. And half the time, we don't know what we know until we stand at a particular site and we go, oh, yes, remember when? And it's not easy to but collate all of that. Exactly. And that's why that's why I say, again, the pre-assessment for me is the most important phase. It really is where we can take everything and it's like a, a new record of all previous historical data. And I mean, I think one ECDA I did, it was full-time work for about two months just to go through all of the data that we had. And people are like, oh, well, we don't really have that much data. We're going to have to resurvey the pipeline. And when it turns out, you actually have so much of it. And an ECDA report at the end of it is a perfect summary. If you were to go back to that, that little table, um, mm -hmm. when you populate that further, and I think we'll build on that going forward, once you populate that table, you've got one sheet summarizing exactly the history of the pipeline, all of your different surveys in each of these different locations. And it really is like a perfect culmination. So even somebody who doesn't know anything specifically about corrosion or the history of the pipeline can look over that and sort of see where you are to date. It's really good. I think one of the challenges that we have with this is that we think we don't know anything. And as you say, as you sit down and think about it, you can pull in a lot of information and it doesn't, as you've already stated, doesn't have to be corrosion related. The physical attributes of the pipeline are critical in understanding how we can manage the potential risks that may occur. 
precisely. I'm just thinking of one example. We had a pickable pipeline and everything looked great for it. But one day we lost a pig and then we lost another pig. And those pigs are still lost somewhere in the pipe network, which tells us that we don't know if there's a dead leg or all sorts of things, but that is information. We know that on two separate occasions, we've lost pigs. They haven't come up the other side. So we know that there is something happening that we haven't considered. Um, and that pipeline has been added to an ECDA program because we can't be sure of what's actually happening. It's pretty interesting. Which, which then is almost contrary. You said at the start of our discussion this afternoon that ECDA is for non-piggable pipes. But I actually think that ECDA is very valuable for all pipes because sometimes you can use pigging data to give you the information to help you determine whether you need to do a visual inspection of a pipe. Precisely. So a great thing to cross-reference with your data that you have, we're talking pipeline potentials and stray current and all that other information, is picking results from either that pipeline or a pipeline in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I say that is within a certain area, you might have a pickable pipeline and a non-pickable pipeline. And if you have severe corrosion on the pickable pipeline, it could be a big indication that there's some kind of short or some kind of stray current that you haven't picked up in other surveys. So that would be a good place to look. So I think that's very realistic. Um, I think now that we've sort of said we've gonna, we're going to gather all this data, we've got all this data, really it's detective work after that to take the different data and compare. I've got data from this point, this point, and this point for potential, but I don't have data from this point regarding wrapping history, for example, but I do on another point that doesn't have a potential. And, you know, you've got to come up and see how much information It's almost like playing odds. You've got to get a almost like a gut feeling. I hate to say that, <laughs> but I think you do need to sort of have a gut feeling and say, in your experience, does this extrapolate? Can I assume that in this situation, I will have the same idea as over here? Or is that something we need to verify? When we're looking at data, one of the things we've mentioned is, is finding the zones. So I've got a couple of slides of types of zones, but what are some of the things that you consider important when you're considering the environmental factors? The most obvious, especially in urban environments, is actually whether or not your pipeline is covered by tar or whether it's not covered by tar and whether or not it's in the vicinity of other services like power lines, like buried water pipes, et cetera. For example, if we were looking at a gas line, any other buried line in the vicinity would also be good to know. Even plastic lines, because that can also, if it's a large plastic line, I've seen examples that others have found where you actually have shielding due to this plastic line right next to your pipeline. So that would be one thing is just even if it's going through the same kind of soil, you do have different above ground issues. Obviously, we have the big thing, like if you have a swamp versus a sand dune, like I think that first picture that you showed, mm. that is obviously a very close potential cell issue there. You've got water, then you've got dry. You've got something that could potentially freeze, for example. There's lots of different things. I would also say that your resistivity of the soil that's not necessarily how wet it is. It could also be very peaty or very dry or rocky, for example. That also makes a big difference as to whether or not you can expect active corrosion. And then one of the other things we need to consider is what is in the environment outside of that. We mentioned schools, but in any high frequency of population or what is within the vicinity that if something went wrong, it could also exacerbate the situation exactly Your prime water source and a fuel line the last thing you want is to to sully your water and then of course stray currents and stray currents can be picked up very far away actually from trains and so especially in countries like south africa where you have dc current sources like trains it's really important that you do a screening test at some stage when you're doing your potential monitoring, just to check. Um, because even though you can't see a train or you're not crossing a train line, doesn't mean that you're not getting some kind of interference going forward. And 
all of these things together really should point a picture of places that you're concerned about. Anywhere you have severe stray currents, we know you can get massive potential fluctuations. You will know that the potential that you can get from a passing train, for example, is astronomical. And even a small time frame in which your pipeline is exposed to that and not protected can have really bad effects on it. So that would be my number one thing. If you have bad straight currents, that is a region and an area for concern, regardless of the other aspects. If it's in the middle of a field and it's a water pipeline, well, if it explodes, it's a waste of water. But nobody's going to probably drown, nobody's house is going to be ruined, and you know the water will still be fine once it's cleaned up. Mm. But the same cannot be said for oil and gas. There's tons of disaster videos that we've said about that. So of course, it does make a difference. Fran, do we automatically do ECDA? Or is there a point where we need to look in, at this process and say, why are we doing this? And should we be doing an ECDA on our pipeline? It isn't something that should just be undertaken lightly. I think the real benefit, and it's something you guys said yesterday, is to take it from the very beginning, the pre-assessment, all the way through to the post-assessment. That's how you get the full benefit of the ECDA. But like you also mentioned, even doing smaller sort of sections or combinations of the different steps can be beneficial. So I definitely wouldn't say everybody should just do an ECDA as soon as you have a non-pickable pipeline. It's particularly useful in cases where you have dubious history or you're not 100% sure what happened to the line, or you have had indications of corrosion that may be occurring, like low potentials, uh, and you need to look at it. And I think in general, if you're planning on decommissioning your pipeline in the next five years, then you don't need to do it. If you are looking to extend your lifetime or you know see how it's going to go towards the end of the lifetime, then this is definitely a good tool because as we'll discuss later on in the last session, I think you can make the decision to extend the useful life of the pipe based on your inspections. Obviously there's ands and buts and all sorts of things like that, but really it could be financially quite important to be able to do this. But again, if there's no financial motive and you're going to decommission your pipeline, there's no point. Or if you've had no indications that there are any problems and you have really good up-to-date monitoring data and good surveys, for example, SIP surveys, then I would say you can probably defer that. No right. need to do unnecessary surveys. Yes, I think that's a very good piece of advice because we're not advocating willy-nilly throwing money at something that's not a problem. However, I do think that regulatory compliance is also quite a big driver, especially in the oil and gas industry, that ECDA or pigging seem to be regulated in terms of their frequency. Yeah, I think in, I mean, this is basically from the US is where I presume you're getting this from. This is obviously a niche standard, so it's an American. I think that there are places at which you're sort of exempt and that is if you've got really good other data you will probably have to do an ECDA at one stage in a non-pickable pipeline's life but probably not every five years for example if you do have good data um, but yes regulations are of course something in there but where we are in South Africa and, and throughout the world it does also influence what's important you know to be legally compliant. Um just going back to how we define our zoning, zoning is not just determined by the fact that our pipeline is located physically in one or other location. A zone is greater than that. And I think if we look at that same table that we pulled up at the start, these are all different zones because not one of them is actually identical in every respect. And would you say that that, that is part of the process is to classify your zones based on all of the information and assessing it all so even if it looks like it's the same zone or the same location geographically it doesn't necessarily mean it is in the same zone from a corrosion perspective absolutely i think probably one of the ecas that we've done before is on a pipeline that's about 10 kilometers long so we're talking about quite a short section and within that there were 12 or 14 zones 
that was it's a very urban environment and we had a lot of different things happening and it was also an old line so there was a lot of history that had to be taken into account and so you really do need to look again put on your good uncle hats and take a big overview picture of it um, you can't just say oh well these this location is only one kilometer from that location as we know one kilometer apart makes all the difference and so definitely you need to look at everything and this is a good way this is the way i prefer to do it to have all the different things and just start going this is where i have this data this is where i have this data and as you go you can start clumping them together the same zone by the way it doesn't need to be next to each other for example here where it says corner x y you might have the exact same thing after the highway crossing right. and that would still be zone one you'd have two zone ones and then you only need to excavate one right yeah I think that's also quite important is to to stop thinking of it as linearly located along the pipeline right but that the zones are are sometimes dispersed yeah. but actually we anticipate the same data in two geographically different locations because when we've looked at all the data they are essentially identical in terms of their background exactly and i think it's important sort of here to note when you are here and as you can see right here it says no data for example, for resistivity, mm -hmm. you after you've done your pre-assessment, your next step is indirect assessment, which we'll talk about. But in this pre-assessment step, you need to decide what information you're missing. And that missing information forms part of our indirect assessment. So any kind of information we don't have, if we don't have straight current data, if we have, well, like a screening for straight current, if we don't have resi resistivity data at all, um, a lot of these things can be combined into one big survey. My favorite survey is combined SIPs DCBG. You get all sorts of good things. We'll talk about that as well. But you've got to use this to decide where and what you're going to do in your indirect assessment step. Right. And your indirect assessment step, which we will talk about next week, will not necessarily be done the same thing at every location on the pipeline. You will only be gathering the information that you still require at Precisely. Each of the locations. Again, right. there's no need to do unnecessary surveys. We're not, we're not here to just spend money or just do things as much as we'd love to do it. We we've got to be pragmatic. If we've got the info, we don't need it again. So essentially, once we've gathered our old construction records and our monitoring or operational histories, our alignment sheets, our old data, once we've looked at all of that together we can then assess it and that actually that assessment is the pre-assessment in terms of determining where we go ahead. One of the intriguing things just before we close off is how do you deal with a situation where people don't want to admit, for example, leak history? It's quite a challenge to get some of the real history out of this system. Yeah. I mean, that is, that's again, something you're going to get like water cooler talk or maybe bar stool talk, depending on who it is from your operations guys. On the company level, you're probably going to get stonewalled. It would be my guess. Um, you know, it's only a bad thing for both parties if we're not sharing the information, but there is this culture of, oh, our mistakes are secret and we'll pay landowners and other people money to keep them quiet and we'll, fix our mistakes as much as possible. But I, I mean, again, I think if I was speaking to asset owners, sharing your experiences can only help you because you'll find that there are other people in the same situation and it'll only help you to sort of be honest about it and to consultants and, uh, and those working for asset owners, you have to be a little bit like sympathetic to their hesitance to share that information. But obviously, we just want to have the good overview so that we can make sure that the pipeline is safe for sort of extended periods of time. So like I said, it's a bit of a bar stool chat. Probably somebody will say something like, you know, um, there was this lady, Vanessa, and it was under her house. You know, they had a small <laughs> leak, but, you know, it's all been taken care of. And then that's something obviously can never be documented, but it's something you know in the back of your head that you can add it. It still exists. It yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Fran. I think we now have a really good idea of the benefits of this thorough in-depth look at the information we have so that we know we can identify what we still need to find out. 
So having looked at our pre-assessment process, we're going to be coming back again to discuss the next stage in the process, which is known as the indirect assessment stage. Thank you. And thank you, Fran, for joining us. Great. Have See a great afternoon. Soon.